All right, welcome everybody to the Poetry by the Sea Awards ceremony. I'm very excited to do this in virtual mode for the first time. Obviously, we love being at Mercy Center and doing it at the banquet and having the wonderful meal and by the sea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in these unprecedented times, we have to take our community where we can. And it's wonderful to see you all here and enjoy, look forward to enjoying your poems. Now, um, my name is Anna Evans, and I'm one of the board members for Poetry by the Sea. Unfortunately, our founder and director, Kim Bridgeford, can't be with us today. She's in Illinois with her family. But I did speak to her earlier on uh, this morning, and she wanted me to pass on her congratulations to all of you. And she also authorized me to read one of her poems. Now, as you all know, this is a weekend, um, the weekend of Juneteenth, and we are going through a period of civil protests um, both uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement and just in general. So I, I wanted to read her poem from dun, 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 Nasty Poets as edited by the wonderful Julie Kane along with Grace Bauer. And Kim's poem is called Why Emily Dickinson Would March on Washington. Just going to let a few more people in before I read that. Um, admit, admit, admit. Okay, uh-oh, uh-oh, please don't lose, please. As you can probably tell, I am in the middle of a thunderstorm here. Anyway, Why Emily Dickinson Would March on Washington by Kim Bridgeford. Unsuffocate, release before, because some things you leave home for with more than jam, and you are ready because sometimes a basket's heavy, because your dashes work away because you have a door, cachet. Because you find you write to sow both life and death, you have to go. That's Kim Bridgeford's poem from Nasty Women Poets. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through the structure of the award ceremony. Um, after I've spoken, I'm going to introduce Julie Kane, who was our wonderful judge for the Sonnet Awards. She's going to uh, talk a little bit about why she picked the two sonnet winners. And then I will introduce Matt Miller, who was our book award judge. Uh, this year, we weren't able to do it the way we did last year because of not having the conference running. So Matt agreed to step in at the last minute and judge the awards. He will introduce or speak a little bit about why he chose the two book winners. And they will then read from their books. And then they'll come back to me and I will close up everything. So uh, that is the structure, and then now it's down to me to introduce Julie. Um, I wrote a little thing. I've known Julie for over 10 years. We met her at Westchester in 2008, I think. And while she is the undisputed queen of the contemporary Villanelle, she is also an outstanding poet in all forms, including the sonnet. Winner of the National Poetry Series in 2002 and of the Donald Justice Prize in 2009. She has also served as the Poet Laureate of Louisiana. Her most recent book is Mothers of Ireland and she also co-edited Nasty Women Poets, an unapologetic anthology of subversive verse. We were honored to have her as our judge for our second sonnet contest. Julie Kane, take it away. I think I have unmuted you. Thank you, Anna. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. It was tough deciding. All the finalists were wonderful, but this one stood out. Niagara Overlook. And this is what I wrote at the time. Who would believe that a contemporary poet could pull off a sonnet in anapestic tetrameter or pull off a metaphysical conceit worthy of John Donne for 14 consecutive lines, let alone pull off both feet in a 21st century poem that touches the reader's heart with its snapshot of a teenage son. A waterfall of applause for this poet and poem. Oh, wait, 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 so much um, for having me read today. And Julie, it, I'm so touched by what you wrote and honored to have a sonnet chosen by 
someone I consider to be not only a great Villanelle writer, but a great sonnet writer. Um, and it means all the more because you didn't know I wrote it. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Um, so I'm going to share the, the, the sonnet that Julie was talking about, Niagara Overlook. Um, this came out of a, an experience several years ago when my family went to Niagara Falls. And um, I realized that while my son was staring at the falls, I was staring at him. Um, so this is um, dedicated to my son, Davey, who is a good bit older now, but this is when he was 16. Niagara Overlook. As you gaze at the falls, unaware that I'm there, I survey your brows drop off, the bluff of your chin and the stone that bobs high in your neck, sharp and thin. The bright eddies and riffles that play in the hair that meanders from temple to earlobe to nape, and above all, your eyes, squinting hard at the view. Eyes I've known since before their transparent spring blue silted over your grandfather's color, dad's shape. What desires are cascading behind that gaze now? What inventions are coursing right up to your brink? How I wish I could ask and go barreling deep. But of course, that's too much for a boy to allow. So I'll stay where I am, far away from the drink, in the hope that one day you'll invite me to leap. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, and Anna kindly asked me to read a couple more poems. Um, so I've got two more. Um, since, since I've honored one family member today with a sonnet, I also want to read one that's dedicated to my mother, um, also known as the writer and artist Gina Angolia Weiner. Um, she died five years ago and would have turned 82 this week. To mom in the beyond. Two candles and three photos had to stand atop the bureau that I used each summer. No space for me to stack some books? Kel bummer. Each mantelpiece and shelf was also planned. Each ledge, nook, countertop, bare inch of floor or wedge of open air beneath a gable. Even the sill behind the ping pong table, those poor doomed tchotchkes, was accounted for. Oh, how your decorating drove us nuts, as tasteful as it was, your certainty that everybody knew it would behoove them to raise no disrespectful ifs or buts and leave each bud vase, bowl, or bottle be. They're all still there, of course. We'd hate to move them. Mm. Um, and a thank you also to the, the wonderful journal Literary Matters, which published that sonnet. Um, and last, um, I'm going to share something that appeared just 10 days ago in the American Bystander. Um, it is titled to the American Psychological Association, Ray Updates. It could also be called Spring 2020 in brief. To the American Psychological Association, Ray Updates. Dear colleagues in the APA, the time has come to introduce, in lay terms for your ease of use, a checklist of anxieties contagious as a viral sneeze and guaranteed to pass your way. In March, we added fear of mail, of shaking hands and touching pets, of germs on burgers and baguettes, of weathering the TP drought until you run completely out of anything to wipe your tail. In April, came concern as well that love and patience will wear thin as walls and kids and spouse close in. That you'll be filing for divorce the week you get laid off, of course, and lose your sense of taste and smell. May brought the nagging worry that the so-called federal relief will mean a respite so damn brief, it's highly possible that you'll use up your groceries and fuel before a hornet lays you flat. Now June, and all at once our list is topped not by the fear of death from someone with corona breath, 
but fear of items you can see. A two by four, a club, a knee, a canister of burning mist. What torments will July contain? Who can predict? But one thing's clear, anxieties we've seen this year, unlike a number in the past, should be without exception classed as signs of being fully sane. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, good job. Okay, um, and Julie, if you would like to say a few words about Jenna's um, crown. Yes, right. I can't wait to hear Jenna's crown read out loud. This is what I wrote about it at the time. I said, this sequence navigates the hyphen between its speakers Vietnamese and American identities, symbolized by the red silk Aoyai she will be wearing as a bridesmaid dress. I don't know which I love more, the speaker's obvious affection for the mother and aunt who still cling to their cultural traditions in American exile, or the moments of genuine humor when those old and new cultures clash. And whoever said the Petrarchan sonnet cannot thrive in rhyme poor English, this poet's slant rhymes are daring and inventive as well as musical to the ear opening up whole roped off areas of the dictionary to her considerable poetic powers. Take it, Jetta. <laughs> okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Julie, for, your, for choosing my uh, sonic crown and for your very kind words. Um, before I read the poem, I just wanted to find a couple words that you might not know. Um, so an ao yai is a traditional Vietnamese dress. Me means mother, and ye is like an aunt. Bridesmaid dress. For daughters of the Vietnamese diaspora, it is not easy to obtain ao yai, the tightly clinging bodice with its high, stiff collar joined by hook and eye type clasper, its long, slim raglan sleeves, two tubes of a whispery silk, must be custom fitted to the size and contours of the wearer's neck, arms, thighs. The girl must stand with perfect posture, aspirate and breathe out naturally while measuring tape is coiled around her belly, breasts and wrists by sternly squatting mother, aunt or sister, all while a savvy female relative stalks through the fabric shop and picks out crepe. It is a whole clan process fraught with love. It is a whole clan process fraught with love. In this one case, my mother's cousin, Hoang, was bold enough to brave the squawking throng of shoppers whose gnarled fingers, like mangrove roots, grabbed at bolts of silk in the alcove on the commercial street, where, flanked by long cascading samples of his wares, the strong-eyed tailor chalked and cut and stitched and wove. Our families strewn across the continent. Yi Huang calls Houston home. I'm in Manhattan. And so we've only met on one occasion. And yet Yi spent four hours selecting satin to make my dress with, hours she could have spent enjoying her too short trip to our ghost's nation. On her two fleeting trip to our ghost's nation, our lost Vietnam, from which she and her siblings were once deracinated like yanked saplings, packed on a boat and pressed into migration. Yi could have had a le leisurely vacation, munching ban bao until her chin was dribbling a brown fish sauce, jawing with old friends while nibbling nostalgia salted snacks. Pure relaxation. But Yi used unrecapturable moments to survey different tints of garnet red for her first cousin's daughter's new ao yai. A love my actions had not warranted, but which I had the luck to be lapped by because my mother's not just any woman. Because my mother's not just any woman, I've benefited from the unearned kindness that constitutes how family is defined. And while Yi Huang was busy in Vietnam on her shopping trip, my mother's most uncommon personality and sharp-toothed sorry, and sharp -toothed mind were tangled in the task of gown design in their own way, 
because she lives with snowmen in Minnesota, I with manhole covers in New York, meh, can't take my measurements. And so she emails me a list of lengths that she commands I find out. My bust size, my outstretched armpit girth, and 20 others. And then she critiques my painstaking replies. My email, meh, rips into my replies. Your neck's a dozen inches? Can't believe it. I snatch my cell phone from my desk, aggrieved, and posing around my neck the googly eyes measuring tape dispenser that was my prize at some past carnival, so that the livid numeral 12 is easily perceived. I take a selfie to prove my throat's true size and text it to her. If my neck's as thick as a buffalo's, so be it. Ned texts back to say she thinks my measurement technique is incorrect. The tape should hover higher, more near my jaw. She's right in point of fact. She's right at all the darndest times. Just try her. Mez right at all the darndest times. Just try her. And yet, when there's a wedding in the offing, the bride has dibs on being right, and scuffling is frowned on when you're in your feast attire. The lovely, universally admired bride in this situation was my dolphin graceful sister her own red eyes ruffling, augmented by the dance floor's amplifier. Her eye was the bright and candid shade of red that brides for eons have arrayed themselves in. Mine, by my request, was darker, as if it had a secret at its heart, a hue befitting someone who takes part, although they've never been much of a talker. Although I've never been much of a talker, I did my bridesmaid duties best I could, my Aoyai helped me feel more understood, for it too did not see its air of lacquered mystique. Though slits coursed up its firecracker red sides, it still with trousers did collude to make sure my legs were never nude and stayed concealed from all would-be hijackers. And it was fun. When the reception came, my sister found me and we took a snapshot, she in her scarlet gown, I in my jasper. We posed like Charlie's angels, fingers aimed straight at the sky. And somehow this seemed apt for daughters of the Vietnamese diaspora. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jenna, Melissa, and Julie. What a wonderful uh, reading, um, beautiful job. And it's uh, worth observing also that Jenna won the sonnet contest last year and the crown contest this year. So um, congratulations, awesome job. Okay, I'm now gonna, if I can ask you three to move yourselves and I will um, move over to the book awards, which we ran almost entirely during the lockdown um, after we knew that we won't be running Poetry by the Sea, but I wanted to go ahead and run them because um, we only started the conference last year. So we had to enlist Matt as our judge and uh, I haven't known Matt quite as long as Julie. I think I met, met Matt three years ago, maybe Matt, at Poetry by the Sea. Um, but he very gamely stepped up to the job, so I'm very grateful to him for doing that. Matt is the author of the collections The Wounded for the Water, which is excellent, by the way. You should read it if you have not. Um, uh, which was Salmon Poetry and Club Icarus, selected by Major Jackson as the winner of the 2012 Vassar Miller Poetry Prize and Kamio Dina Poems. Uh, he has published poems and essays in various poetry journals, and he won the River Sticks Microfiction Prize and the Iron Horse Reviews Trifecta Poetry Prize. He was a former Wallace Stegner Fellow and uh, a Walter E. Dakin Fellow at the Swanee Writers' Conference. He teaches English at Phillips Exeter Academy and lives in New Hampshire. Matt, would you like to speak a little bit about the two, um, book, well, the various books that you um, had the uh, pleasure of judging? Um, sure, should I start with? Uh, yeah, start with the first book and start with the runner up and then do the winner and then the runner up in the book award and then the winner. All right, so I'll start with Chad. Hey, Chad. <laughs> Uh, I'm just gonna look, pull this up real quick. Um, Chad's book, uh, you know, makes the, the two universal, universal stories of addiction, abuse, and violence topics we, we think we may have seen too much. We, how can we see this ever see this new again? And he, and he pumps them with new life and beauty and resonance. 
And he contains all those swings of raw hurt and ecstasy in such masterly deft and strict form and meter. He makes every poem like a, like a hand grenade with a pin pulled out. Um, I remember just feeling, I'd re I'd read the, I had read this book before I even saw it came across here and I'm like, oh, I can't pick Chad's book because I know the poem already. I know the poet, we were in a conference workshop together and I just kept going back to it and back to it. I'm like, God, this thing just gets better and better. And I'm more and more jealous of what he can do. And it was so hard to pick any of these, you know, to pick out these books. I just remember feeling broken open when I got to that last poem. It was like, I actually remember thinking like at the end when it first time I read Blood Meridian, I just threw the book across the room because it just broke me open. I was like, read the last couple of poems in Chad's book. I felt the same way. I was like, oh, and it was so good. Um, so I just want to say that about his book. All right, Chad, Chad, that's your opportunity to read us, read us some poems. Chad, are you here, Chad? Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt, so much. I really appreciate those words, man. And thank you, everybody, for uh, the opportunity to read um, and to hang out with such talented, lovely people. Um, I'll just read four poems from the book, uh, The Last Visit. The next, or the first one's called um, Negatives Under Microscope. I'm focused on the space inside your eyes. First pupil, then iris, now cellular disruption in search of some clear catalyst, some reason for these scars, for this crooked helix on my chest. I want the DNA for empty bottles. I need to know what made your cruelties grow unwieldy like cancers set loose upon a body. I've scoured the entire frame pushed past the edge of every family negative, believing the secrets hidden like a code between the plastic and the acetate. I stare for hours at a single portrait, deducing from a smile the hell behind your face. At times, I think I smell the whiskey sweet perfume of you, as though each image captured something of how you lived, how you breathed. But then each clue turns out a part of me, a hair, a thumbprint left while leafing through the pile of specimens, a flake of skin, a barely visible scratch I made in haste. More me than you, more you than science, naked and pinned down beneath the lens as though our cause is finally in the frame, begging for exposure, for the light. This next poem is called Halloween. I think this is the first piece from this book that I had uh, published back in 2014 with um, 32 poems. Halloween. For Halloween this year, I'll be a man. I'll work my hands to bloody rags and use my fists to prove which truths I understand. I'll paint my face into a mask of bruise, like coming home after a barroom fight. A man should fight, my father said, and lose sometimes, no matter if he's wrong or right. I'll swallow up a pint of Cuddy Sark. I'll stumble home and fumble with the light. He said, if you drink, you won't feel the marks. You'll never know the places where you've bled. For Halloween, I drink the autumn dark. I'll be a man the way my father said. On Halloween, we're closer to the dead. His teeth were crooked. His hands were red. Just a couple more. This poem is called A Voice from the Wreck. <clears throat> I'm an accident on the south side of town, on the outskirts, where the desert holds its ground against the streetlight's last defenses. I'm the fire leaping from the Chevy's frame to smite the sky and drain the cool out of the night. 
I'm the cell phone and someone's shaking hand, woken up by the explosion in the street, the calls for help. I'm an ambulance, a siren in the dark. I'm the stoplight. I'm the kid out driving drunk, vodka on his breath and bile in his throat. I'm the headlight slamming final recognition. And when you whisper names like curses in your room, I'm the smell of gasoline in bloom, the blood-stained moon behind the clouds. I guzzle broken bones and busted radiators, coolant running thick in thirsty gutters. And if you ever manage to shut your eyes, to sleep, I'll wander from the wreckage as you dream. And last, I'm gonna read a sonnet because you can't do poetry by the sea without reading a sonnet, right? Um, this is called On the Dread Ranch Road, just off 283. Stars are fired up like scattershot. The howls of wolves who saunter near extinction echo across the plains until they're not. All of them are headed one direction. My father was a drinker, so am I. An echo of a tune in drunken time. The bottle is an instrument, and rye, the amber music spilling over. I'm thinking about the rhythm of decline. He measured his in knuckles, hookers, drinks. I start to wonder how I'll measure mine the ballad of the triple whiskey jinx, but the wind begins to sigh of tired things. I pull the bottle from the bag. It sings. Thank you very much. And I just want to say thank you so much, Chad. And Chad will be one of our spotlight readers in 2021, correct, Chad? Thank you. That is Looking absolutely forward to, Looking forward to hearing a longer selection from your work. Excellent. Right. I'm going to hand it back to Matt to say something about Maya's book, which was the. So, um, background noise there. You know, when Chad took the, the big stories of hurt and squeezed them into volatile nutshells, Maya took the small story of a life, uh, not like any of our lives, and wrote it large across the screen of ancient and eternal epic. The erasure of the Odyssey that she starts the, po the book off with blasted over me like some John Williams opening credit score. And I was like, oh, wow, this is gonna be a ride. And it was, weaving a, man's, uh, <clears throat> weaving a man's life and running it through the epic of Odysseus, weaving it through all poetic richness and possibilities of English, making and breaking inherited forms, he mythologized and gave this life, every life, a reckoning, saying this person was here, this was his name, this is my name, these are our names, and we are here and we matter. And I just was like, it is a beautiful book. And in both these books, I saw them as on the same road going different directions. And I saw them kind of giving each other a head nod in a way and doing their own things in a different way. And I was like, these things are, they, I'm just so impressed by both of these books of, of fathers. Uh, Maya is brilliant, I loved it. Okay, Maya, we'd love to hear some poems from the book. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Matt, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to Poetry by the Sea for having me. So I'm going to read a few books from Eru, a few books, a few poems from Eru. Um, this one is called 23 Madison Avenue. Today, after the cable is disconnected and the phone line is cut, after the electricity bill goes unpaid, this is what is left behind. Rusted frying pans, ceramic mugs, winter coats, all 27 years boxed and taped while the wedding dress hangs untouched in the closet, the lace stretched over the front like a web. Since my mother stopped wearing the ring, we don't speak of him. We don't speak of the mice dying in the walls, the everywhere smell of rat poison and rot. Maybe today, no rot. 
only rooms of undying, only rooms of open windows and lights, so that maybe today this can be the house I grew up in. The ceilings will patch themselves up. The windows will unbreak and open themselves to the yard, which will tame its wild forest of bushes and weeds. The fence pulls itself back up in this house, now another, on main across the church, on cedar by the pier, blooms yards of perennials and trimmed grass, pathways of measured brick. The door, open and familiar, greeting us as though we never left anything behind. Ode to my father's failed heart. It's okay. I too have failed at the expected, have sputtered and choked like a rusty valve in water, have jumped into the pool only to sink. Little engine, your flawed machinery is nothing like love. You limp at last call to the dance floor but feel no shame in your offbeat two-step. Your 11th hour shuffle in a dead man's shoes. There's nothing left but the encore, so go ahead. Relax. Unravel like a loosened knot. Overripe fruit in his chest. You blush with uncertainty. Bruise yourself tender, little heart. Tiny treasure. Sweetened to the point of spoil. After his death, will my father be beautiful? Or will he fade like a t-shirt in the wash? Will he fray at the edges like the pages of a book or harden and sour like weak old bread? Will he be an umbrella turned out in the storm when the storm happens and it happened? So did he bloat or wilt? He rode or rust? My father, did he recede like the tide? Is my father more beautiful as water or as dirt? Is my father the ugliness of dirt or the elegance of bones and the body? Is lovely what we call it, the body without body? Is graceful what we call it, the everything at rest? And the rest, if we've no words left to offer, shall we call it grand? Shall we say it's beautiful? My father's mahogany box, was it beautiful? And the pink and red roses in the grave, were they beautiful? And when the black hearse came, was it beautiful? And when the sky opened with rain, was it bright and quiet and beautiful? Or was it just frightening? How it drank everything away. All right. Uh, so as has been mentioned, there's a lot of mythology in my book. It definitely... Um, works off of the Odyssey and various other Greek myths. Um, so this is a poem that has some of that in it, some of those references and images. It's called Revision and it's after a poem by Matthew Dickman. There is no woman, no face to launch a thousand ships. So there are no ships in this version. No boys dressed as soldiers in armor too large. No bronze shields forged by the fire of Hephaestus. No spears or swords sharpened on a whetstone of bone. No ocean of a vengeful god to cross. No monsters, no beasts, only men. A few fishermen on the wharf drinking in ancient lawn chairs. No worries but the money, mackerel and mullet. Women, weather and wind sails, business as usual. No gods in this version, but the ones in their favor. The Delphic lottery forever a chorus of yes. And as for the kingdom, no matter. And no country beyond the sea, no land but this one. In this version where the homes sit content on well-kept lawns, where the horses know no sharpness or scatterings of war. In this version, the heroes return home at the end of the day, and the beds sigh with their weight. And war is a word unknown, unspoken, addict in the mind. In this version, then, consider the horse. Not wooden, but made of hair, 
and flesh and muscle, racing like sunlight through a country all his own. And in his mouth, not an army of men, but a town, no, a city of wood and stone and thatch where the fires stay lit through the night, but where nothing ever burns. All right, I'll read two more. Um, I wasn't going to read this one initially, but um, I feel like now I, I needed to read a sonnet. So <laughs> um, this is, I mean, I don't know if this is gonna be accepted by you guys because it is a broken sonnet. Um, it has, it comes with, it's inspired by um, the Greek, the Greek tragedy plays in, in the sense that it has uh, stage directions and the sonnet is broken by these, by the voice of the chorus and uh, the chorus speaks in couplets. So uh, here's the stage direction. It's called Argo and stage directions are enter Jason 40 years later in the hull of a time-worn ship in parentheses Enter Medea, silent, unseen, in the background. Doesn't a man deserve a les legacy, a memory, a wife to carry him through the years to bear the name of he, though forged of bronze, this man who would have been gilded, dressed in gold, doesn't he deserve to want? Chorus, if God waits in your bed, if gold waits in your bed, why not take it as lover? Poor Midas. Why not forge you a feast if gold wets your hunger? Even now, when nothing remains but dark and rot, still, surely he deserves more than his body, a boat, worn, stilled, stayed, chorus. If gold grants you youth, steal away your years old. If you tire of man's trappings, why not fleece you in gold? In ports, this his last, his only home, but at least a legacy here. At sea, right? He must be remembered somehow, but does he not also have sons, a daughter? What has he built? Chorus. What promises, what vows are engraved in gold? In myth, whose triumphs, whose stories are told? But empires in his image, to be raised, to fall heavily as a mast, a stern, sturdy, stalwart, or aged, if nothing left but this, its weight be praised. Medea exit, light as wind through a sail on a chariot of the sun. All right, uh, thank you again for having me. This is my last poem. Poem ending with a scene of a woman alone. How can she place him? The absence of his body unframed in the doorway of, his apart of her apartment unsunken into the side of her bed where she doesn't sleep. The air gathers, puckers around him, or the almost him she imagines. The current warm, then cool, then warm again like the breeze of a turning fan in summer. Even now in his hollowness, in his somewhat not quite, still he fills the room like water in a pitcher. Inside her apartment, he's messy, unsure of himself, whatever self there is of him, spilling everywhere, trying the freshly vacuumed rug, the mopped hardwood floors, the lavender-scented candle in its glass votive holder. She worries about the neighbors, what they've made of their long fights and long conversations, if they know what has been changed, what she considers unspeakable. What will they think? when she steps out into the everything beyond her door that hers is a shape unaccompanied, but for something resembling grief, what will they make of her? May she open her windows, her screen door to the sun, though when it catches him, he'll fleck and flicker like an aluminum screen, be there then not at all, when every other second widows her again. So, yes, so she'll let them all see she, Mere she in her onlyness, standing at the door, the wind ambling in, formless, uninvited, breaking where she stands. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Maya. That was beautiful. Uh, congratulations again to you and to Chad. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to Matt to talk a little bit about the other book awards. Yours was the first book and these were the uh, poets with more than one book. Sorry. Sorry about that. Is that you? You're good. <laughs> Trying to do things at once. So, um, yeah, the next book is um, the runner up is Becky Faust, Unexploded Ordnance Bin. Um, I was thinking of all these poets just make me want to throw my poems in a trash barrel fire. Uh, <laughs> they're so good. There's so many things I just want to just take from them. But, uh, but Becky's chapbook spun me around with its richness of sound, play of internal rhyme, and alliterative energy, its images, and its sensible line. I found myself having to say poems out loud just to, to feel the music of my lips and tongue and teeth, just to make them my own for a second. This is, I kept coming back to this one from the poem Blame, olive tree that dropped its great gout of dark fruit onto asphalt for the swerve and spin out etched in fresh virgin press. Blame, and then I just kept going. I was like, oh, this is so good. Um, and the move to parallel an unexplored ordinance bin with a narrative of motherhood, a son's autism, um, so, to do it so perfectly with such honesty and clarity without ever drifting into the sentimental or the angry, it was amazing. I felt raised up and strong for having walked with it for a while. And I just really loved it, Becky. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks everyone. Well, thank you to the committee for running the contest. I know how much work it is. And thanks for choosing my book and thanks everyone for being here. It's, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'm going to read the title poem from my book. This is my book. And I'll read the first poem. I think I'm only going to have time to read two because the title poem is a bit long. Um, so like the book, it's called The Unexploded Ordinance Bin. And what inspired this is um, we were at the Cape, uh, Cape Cod, and noticed a, a, a battleship kind of moored out there that was kind of broken in half with the two ends canted up. And when I asked about it, I was told that it had been used for decades as target practice by the Navy. And that's when I heard about uh, the problem with unexploded ordnance on those beaches. It's also a problem on the West Coast. Uh, people find, you know, ammunition, munitions, bombs, all kinds of things um, just wash up on the beach. So that's the background for that. And you also need to know that the Perseids are um, an annual summer meteor shower that happens in Massachusetts. And the sun that, um, my son that I'm writing about in this poem is on the autism spectrum. The unexploded ordinance bin. Our son found the hollow shell, snub nosed and finned and looking like an Acme cartoon bomb where we raked for clams. He wanted to keep it and we wanted to let him. Even the old oyster man wanted to let him, but we'd read about the shell found and kept for three weeks by a boy in Oregon before the powder dried and it went off. We took a few minutes to snap photos of our son, an ordinary boy then putting the shell under his sister's pillow and pretending to launch it at all the foods that made him gag. At the police station, the desk sergeant crooked a thumb towards the dune with its big metal spin and warning sign. Once a month, he said, we set them all off and it really lights the place up. It's too small to be seen, the gene causing autism, but I imagine it anyway with snub nose and fins and powder waiting to dry, first words blown off in a way like the fingers of that Oregon boy whose mom's grief I used to feel safe from, who let her son keep his bomb in ignorance or faith, strong as my own caution, that led in the end to the same spectacular dismemberment of the future. And I wonder what would it look like, the bin for safe disposal of genes, 
that can ruin children. And I think maybe it's my own body or rather the body without children or rather the body that's lucky or belonging to someone still living in ignorance and improbable faith or maybe the bin is the world before a war and original sin when to be human was all promise and radiance unwinding dawn mud flats into long shining ribbons pink as a newborn baby's gums and elsewhere a family in a warm illuminated room is eating steamed clams or just any ordinary dinner as if it weren't going to blow all to hell any second all those bright dreams lit up like tracer fire over the dark dunes like the perseids only not at all like the perseids so thanks for listening to that and to Birmingham Poetry Review who published it first. I, I think I just read a review of Chad's book in, in the latest Birmingham Poetry Review. That was a good review. Congratulations. It made me buy the book. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm just going to close with the, um, the opening poem for the book, which is a sonnet. And it's called Only. And uh, it's the, it's the title poem for my new manuscript, which will be coming out with four-way books in 2022. Only. Oh, love, this happened, or it did not. In a room with green walls, my son was born. His cord was torn too soon, so they cut off his head to save his heart. He lived for a long time. For a long time, there was no breath or cry. When finally he spoke, he spoke the wide whirled leaves of corn. He spoke the crickets in clusters beneath the sheaves. He sang the soil in. He sang the wind in the dune and the hush of ebb tide. Some say he died. Some say he died. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. Um, beautiful, really beautiful. I'm going to hand it back to Matt to talk a little bit about the winning book. Uh, yeah, so Richard Forster's uh, Boy in a Step. Uh, you know, when I, I agreed to do this, you know, he, this whole contest thing, I was like, all right, this shouldn't be too bad. I'll read a few little books of poetry. And then I got Richard's and it was 264 pages, new and select. <laughs> Wait, and I almost wrote to Anna like, ah, oh, what did you do? <laughs> and um, whereas, and I think like, you know, Becky's book is a little book and it feels so huge. But and then Richard's book is this huge book that I thought was going to just be, just take me forever. And I just it felt so intimate and small in, a, in, a, in that kind of great way, like a, like a, a jewel. I just, I just couldn't find, I found myself not being able to let, let go of it and let go of poems and lines. Um, uh, you know, at first I was like, no way, I mean, this whole thing is too big, but then it was, and it was perfect. It just kept moving from poem to poem, seeing this life lived, a uh, life lived through art, all these rough hewn, complicated, at times compromising moments of living in this world, cut into diamonds of clarity. I was really impressed and inspired to see how he kept pushing his art too. You could see this, this life of, of a poet, never losing his voice, his signature, ever on the poems, but never resting on what he had done before, never afraid to lean into the new and the unknown. Uh, I really, I mean, besides the poems just being stunning through, and years of stunning poems, it made me happy and hopeful to be living the life of a poet too. It was just something just, just wonderful about that. And uh, I don't know, I think we could all take something from that. Richard, Richard, please share some poems from the winning book. Thank you. Well, Matt. first of all, thank you for honoring this book. And um, it is, you know, a doorstop in a, in a way. It, it covers 40 years of my writing. 
Uh, it's my eighth book. And I want to say, I don't know if he's here, but I'm grateful to Stephen Huff at Tiger Bar Press, a small, small press for, for allowing me to put this together. And thank you, for Poetry by the Sea, for, for allowing this to happen. I, I'm very, very grateful. Um, I have um, four poems that I'll read for you. And they, I selected them because they touch on themes that seem to be consistent over my entire writing life. And like Maya, I'm very involved with, with mythology. Um, it underlies a lot of my writing, even if there are no overt allusions uh, to it. This one um, is based on the myth of Adonis, that demigod who is killed, goes down into the earth, the blood enriches, and he comes back in the spring. Uh, but in ancient Athens, um, I, I just find this fascinating. Uh, the women would have a summer festival called the Adonia, um, they would take broken shards of pottery and plant force um, fennel seeds and other herbs in it. And then during the, the festival, they would put the shards up on the roof in the blazing heat of an Athens summer where they would wilt. They would gather them up and then in a procession, they'd go down to the sea moaning the death of, of, of Adonis. Um, year after year after year. Uh, here's my take on it in, in York, Maine, uh, called A Pot of Crocuses. The weathered crocus pot, which I coddle each winter under salt marsh hay, again commands its center stage in my kitchen window. In terrace beds, the corms poke through the soil like randy waking gods, their pale phalluses swelling in the sun. All morning, I reveled in the comfort of ancient ritual till my neighbor's scab-kneed boy on Easter break began to trundle up and down the street on his skateboard, trying to gain the necessary speed that could spring-load him into air. As if in that moment, he would escape once and for all the tedious maze of his adolescence and return perfect and unbloodied to an earth remade invincible with flowers. So I watched in secret and found myself urging him on, but soon he slouched off with raw abraded palms toward home, and I felt I needed to call him back, my not quite budding Adonis but could see on the asphalt beneath my window the small red stains from his hands. And I wanted to say, here, take these crocuses to your mother, so she might forgive the scarring a woman has to endure to see a boy safely to manhood. Instead, I stood there wavering with that crowded pot of spikes in my hands, and knew if I had summoned him, it wouldn't have been for any promise of beauty I had to offer, nor any incorruptible idea of it, nor even the cherished terracotta I've buried and retrieved these 15 years. For how could I have looked him in the eyes and not knowing which of these must end up broken first? Another poem in which I'm, I'm looking at a young man. Um, I seem to do that quite a bit. <laughs> but uh, ad childhood adolescence has always um, been one of my themes. Uh, this one is set in Provincetown, where, where I was at a, a gay B&B, &B, um, looking at this group of, of men. Um, and they turned out to, their, their club was called Guns and Hoses, and they were gay firemen and police officers. And, and I just taken aback. And, and one young man, um, I noticed after people were in bathing suits, was covered in tattoos. And um, 
this poem goes back to my family's history. Uh, my parents were German immigrants. They arrived separately in the early 20s, in the 1920s. Uh, whereas my family, large family in, in Germany, survived World War II. And um, they must have been complicit in the Nazi terrorism in some way, either through silence or, or participating. I don't know. Um, but here's Poolside in Provincetown. I couldn't help scrutinizing the faded inks he wore like a manifesto, fleshed out constellations of, let me start over, two things you'll need to know. Um, the radiant gammas, uh, the letter, Greek letter gamma, refers to the swat sticker. And Gamora was the alien, uh, <laughs> the Allies firebombing of Hamburg in 1943, where my mother's family lived. I couldn't help scrutinizing the faded inks he wore like a manifesto, fleshed out constellations that floated on pallid skin. His arms were sculled and daggered, twinned sibilant bolts zagged his thighs, and through the thicket of his chest, hooded ember-eyed knights peered. His pierced nipples doubled as a shield bossed with pink suns. Within the cloak's deep folds, the cross wavered like flames when he laughed, seeing me cock my head to read the scripted Gothic motto that arched round his belly's sunken grotto, Aryan nation. I don't know when exactly I loosened to his barleyed charm, but soon I was swigging beers, able to imagine him clothed, less a stranger than close acquaintance, feckless as my uncle in Hamburg when I was eight, unwrapping like a sacred totem the ribbon, the ribboned medal the Fuhrer gave my grandmother for bearing 18 pure Aryan children to the Reich. How my mother beamed. It proves that the family's not Polish, but Prussian. That stylized eagle somewhere still clutches in its talons the broken cross I thought was a sin even to jot on paper. Now there, against the pool's blue tiles, amid the playful chaos of that young man's plashing feet, just above his ankle bone, those four radiant gammas seem to spin like an old world windmill's veins set to some slow, relentless, grinding task. Miraculous what survives. Like those sibling aunts and uncles beneath the Allies' firestorms, only to emerge unscathed from Gomorrah's strafed shelters. And my mother, secure in her white gloves and post-war hats in the Bronx, when did I finally understand the import of that scarred silence the day she hurried us off the bus after I asked, pointing, why the man beside me had tattooed numbers on his wrist? This other one, too, caught me mutely staring, but had no ill-fitting sleeves to tug, nothing at all to hide, no gesture I might misread as shame. Thank you. Um, but this poem um, is set by the sea um, in York Harbor, Maine. And I wrote it, or I began writing it, after my partner um, died of pancreatic cancer. And it happened quickly, and all of a sudden, you're, you're thrust into loneliness and grief. And um, that's happened to me before with a prior partner um, dying of, of cancer. Um, so I'm trying to make sense of it. Um, and basically it's about how do we find home? How, how do we live content in the home we have or can make for ourselves? And there's, a, and again, one of those uh, $50 words in here, um, Kibla, uh, which is the niche in a mosque um, that the uh, faithful bow down toward facing Mecca. 
dead reckoning. After drinks and dinner at the dockside, alone by the shore, not wanting the summer dusk to dwindle further toward the singular darkness of home, I watched the last few vessels grumble out, dead reckoning on the tide. Somewhere in sun-glanced haze, the lobstermen's buoys were calling like sirens from atop the swells. Weeks before, the ruddy flesh of one I loved in less than a breath had left me adrift, staring at a map of nowhere. When the boats were gone, I found myself wondering how the ancients measured from the illusory line at vision's end to pinpoint place, a kibla for every aspiration. And I began to unroll their words in my mind. Astrolabe, azimuth, apogee, already composing this page, trying to triangulate a way between two lands, dig enough my Jesuits taught through life's rust and rugged umbers, and they'll yield a chart, a carpus rose, a key, sextant, zenith, star. From our bedroom window each morning, each morning's horizon curved into boundless exhalation as prayer should before arcing back on itself, an infinity circumscribed two lives entwined as one bobbing speck in the sea. Core, corpus, coracle. Love was the vessel I believed should bear us toward our distant destination. In the twilight air, I tried to reclaim that breath, flood my lungs with a burning I'd once known when gladly I let every fixed mark unmoor. It was then a great blue heron leapt from the marsh grass beside me, oared up so close I felt the wing beats quake of annunciation. Its rising arc tugged me, gasping in the briny nothing of that moment's fear, and I followed in the wake, a silhouette trawling the dusk-deep sky, its legs two useless rudders, neck torqued ungainly, until by sure degrees the bird tacked toward some distant roost beyond night's smudged horizon, and every way I turned led home. Thank you. I'll end with um, the last poem in the book. Um, and and um, in a little over half an hour, we have the, the summer solstice. So I'm gonna th thrust us ahead six months to the winter solstice. And where I lived until two years ago in, in Cape Nettick, Maine, uh, the property abutted a tidal river. And in winter it would freeze over. And with the tide coming in and out, the, um, the ice would crack and you would hear it in the middle of the night sometimes, um, a booming sound. Um, and I should also mention um, one of those big words um, in, in the last line of the poem, Widdershins. Uh, my first job after graduate school was working for a dictionary company. Yes, you got it, <laughs> Kate. Um, and it, it was um, a revision of the World Book Dictionary. It took three years, and this is before computers when everything had to be typed and proofread and galleys reread and corrected and reproof read and and I would make note cards of words that you know I, I thought was interesting and Wittershins means moving in a direction contrary to the sun and um, since this poem is about a body and the body only moves in one direction uh, whereas the sun starts rising in the sky at the winter solstice uh, that's the, the conceit and in, in, in that image winter solstice how quick the plummet, moon sharp, the flint sparked air, our river crackling on the full extreme of the tide. How pristine this burden, snow coiled like a widow's shawl about the shoulders of the world. How numbly we face this whiteness, its weather-worn scars, our fading trajectories, like scavenging deer, 
and into it all this rodent thought creeps its way out of troubled sleep. A crosshatch of tunnels, vascular runs where hunger follows blindly on hunger, gnaws every tender tendrilling, brutal and indifferent, like beauty, like this night's shimmered desolations, like a body blanketed yet beneath so nakedly vulnerable. How inexorable these silent turnings as one from a window back toward the darkened room and returning the thought of you downed in sleep as the tide of a sudden snaps the solid mask of things. How quick the Widdershin's flesh tinders into flame. Thank you all so much for being here. Appreciate it much. Thank you, Richard. That was wonderful, really beautiful poems. And thank you to everyone. Okay, so thank you to our wonderful judges, Julie, Kane, and Matt Miller, to our volunteers, Melissa Balmain and Jenna Lay, and to, of course, our book award winners, Maya Phillips, Chad Abusnabab, Becky Faust, and Richard Forster. What I'm going to do is unmute everyone so that we can have a tumultuous uh, round of applause, and then we can have a cacophonic like discussion, uh, all 24 or three of us, as there is now. So uh, let's have the applause first. Yay. 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 Awesome job, everybody. Awesome job. OK, I'm going to put it into gallery view. And uh, um, yeah, thank you all very much for being here. I think thank we you, need, Anna. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. I think thank we needed this as, uh, for our poetry community, right? It was wonderful to see you, everyone. Wonderful to hear those poems. It just feels like a little piece of poetry by the sea right here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, hi, Claudia. Hey. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kathleen. See that? Hey, Wendy. Oh, wonderful reading. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, everybody. Enjoy the summer solstice. This, I'm going to stop recording it right now, and I, it will be up uh, on the website at some point. And um, I'm excited to do that for everybody. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Beautiful, beautiful reading. Thank you, Chad. Everybody. Just and beautiful. Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Really enjoyed everybody's reading. Thank you so Thank much. You, yes. Wonderful. Thank you all.